Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. We're in Matthew chapter 9. Here's verse 18. As he was telling them these things, suddenly one of the leaders came and knelt down before him, saying, My daughter just died. But come, lay your hand on her, and she will live. So Jesus and his disciples got up and followed him. All right, so let's pause right here. You're about to see two different women in verses 18 uh, through the end of the chapter uh, come before Jesus, or sorry, not not before the end of the chapter, rather uh, particularly to verse 26. (coughs) Two different women come forward. We're going to look at each woman's story individually, but it, it all hinges upon this segue. We have the Pharisees publicly fasting, John the Baptist's disciples are fasting. It never really looks like Jesus and his disciples ever fast, but they're just hanging out. It's a groom's, it's like a groom with his groomsmen and this, this, uh, what what Jesus is teaching and the way that he lives, it's totally incompatible. It's totally incompatible with rabbinic tradition and the Pharisaical legalism. As incompatible as new cloth patching an old garment. As incompatible as new wine in an old wineskin. It would just burst. It couldn't contain what's about to come. And then, as that's happening, see that in verse 18? As he was telling them these things, so as he was giving them the teaching about, no, they put new wine into fresh wineskins and both are preserved. As Jesus was telling John the Baptist's disciples these things, suddenly one of the leaders came and knelt down before him. So this is one of the leaders of the synagogue. It didn't look like Jesus and his disciples were as righteous as the Pharisees, but the synagogue leader knew who was really in charge here. He may not have been making a big deal about his public fasting. In fact, it looked more like a bachelor party, a Christian kind, according to the text here. But the synagogue leader came to Jesus. And he came came to him with absolutely beyond the most urgent request that a human being could make. It was not, my daughter is dying. It was not, my daughter is sick. It was, my daughter just died. She's, She's already dead. He's not just asking for a healing, he's asking for a miraculous resurrection. So when we look at these two women and their two stories, one of them is afflicted with you know, an internal bleeding and she's miraculously healed. But this other, this other woman, the daughter, right, the daughter of the, the, the leader of the synagogue, Jairus' daughter, is resurrected from the dead. Um, I knew of a youth pastor who preceded me to one of my previous positions. And his twin brother's child died in the crib of SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome. And this predecessor of mine, his twin brother, who was in ministry, publicly stepped down from ministry and even departed from the Christian faith, as I understand it. And it made waves. And at the time, having never been through anything remotely like that in my own life up to that point, I could not cast judgment on this guy. I could not say, um, like, wow, his faith was weak. He shouldn't have done that. But it didn't sit well with me. And all that I knew that all I could really do was kind of speculate as to how I might have reacted in a similar situation. But I did resolve. I did make a decision. I did, I did say, if something tragic like that were to happen, I would not denounce the faith. I would invite the church into the story. And I would minister from my pain, hopefully thereby redeeming it in some way, letting God take over the narrative and then letting others hopefully observe within me the testimony of a Christian who grieves in accordance with faith. That was aspirational on my part. I don't claim to have done that, but that was what was on my heart when I first heard about this. It would be a year later that my family would face something similar, and I likewise would lose a child. It was not sudden infant death syndrome. It was, it was something quite different. It was a series of roller coasters, like he's going to live, he's not going to live. He's going to live, you better, you better call your family. He's going to live a normal life. He's breathing the same air as you and me. In fact, we might even be able to give him an artificial tracheal implant one day, and then all of a sudden we might be in his final hours. And this went back and forth like this for an entire season, uh, for months and months on end. And then my child died. 
I knew while Aiden was alive. I even posted about this on Facebook. Uh, it, it's still there, I think. It, it happened in the year 2012, somewhere between the months of March and May. And uh, I had resolved that even after the heart rate monitor connected to Aiden's bed went to zero and it rang out its ugly tone, that I would still even ask for God's miraculous healing, that it would not be for a lack of faith on Aiden's father's part that Aiden would die, but be because this was the will of God. So I would look back and have no regrets. I can identify because I prayed this prayer. God, my son, just that is on May 27th, 2012. I prayed this prayer, even as the monitor rang out that ugly monotone. In fact, the doctor came over and muted it. That was a deviation from how I anticipated that moment might go. But I still prayed that prayer. Uh, this was absolute desperation. This is beyond, beyond the worst that it gets. This is the, this is the, the greatest grief that someone can suffer in life. And you can imagine then the urgency within this father, because he doesn't know the mechanics of how Jesus' miracles work. He just knows this Jesus has worked miracles. As the leader of the synagogue, what, this, what he just did may have seemed even sort of rebellious because the Jewish authorities certainly didn't take kindly to Jesus. But this Jewish authority, this synagogue leader, believed that Jesus could do something. In our most desperate moments, we turn to God. Uh, the, the saying goes, there are no atheists in foxholes. Uh, and the atheists who, who, who clamor all over themselves to correct that statement, you know, don't act in accordance with atheism because they're acting with passion as though something has meaning. And the moment they presuppose meaning, they forsake their atheism. This man knew he was desperate and that Jesus worked miracles. And so defying what authorities there were over him, he pled with Jesus. Not knowing, is there an expiration date to Jesus' resurrection work? We would see him come on the fourth day after Lazarus' death to resurrect Jesus in John chapter 11. That was intentional because it was thought after day three, you were really good and dead in the Jewish culture. Hence Jesus' own resurrection on the third day. But this man didn't know any of that. He was desperate. So I want to emphasize this so that you have perspective on the miracle that follows. While Jesus is going to heal this woman who suffers from internal bleeding, while she reaches out and she touches the end of his robe, this man, Jairus, this, this synagogue leader whose daughter has just died, is anxious out of his mind. All right, he, his daughter has just died. Like, clearly, my situation is more urgent than anybody else's Jesus. But Jesus is limitless in his virtue, limitless in his power. He's truly omnipotent. There's a false teaching about Jesus that says Jesus' emptying of himself somehow means that he'd had no power, that he was no longer one with the Father. This is a diminished view of Christ. He physically existed in time and space, but his knowledge and his unity with the Father and the, the, his power was not dictated by wherever his sandals could take him. This was the whole point of the miracle of the centurion and his servant, who was miraculously healed, likewise, while Jesus was in absentia, from a distance, as per the centurion's request. Hence, Jesus marveled at the great faith of the centurion, who grew up probably worshiping the sun, when all the leaders of Israel, having been steeped in education, memorizing Genesis through Malachi, didn't get this. This centurion got it. So we know that Jesus is able to perform miracles without being in physical proximity to somebody. He's already proven that. This man has come to Jesus not quite with the same faith or realization of the centurion. He, he believes that Jesus has to physically come and be there. Do you see the distinction? This is why Jesus marveled at the centurion. Even this synagogue leader, learned as he was, didn't quite grasp that. Yet Jesus meets him where he is and is following him through the crowd. I want you to get the desperation of this synagogue leader as we go into tomorrow's text.